Good to go. Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. My name is Barry Day. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you today to today's uh, event in my capacity as chair of the uh, Edmonton Regional Group of IPAC. For those of you who may not be uh, familiar with IPAC, it's a dynamic association of public servants from all orders of government across Canada, as well as academics and others interested in uh, public administration. The Edmonton Regional Group is one of 18 regional IPAC groups across Canada. And uh, in Edmonton region, we have uh, more than 700 members. Puts us at the second largest regional group in the country. I think we're right behind uh, Toronto. We've got members from all levels of government, provincial, federal, uh, municipal, including the cities of St. Edmonton, St. Albert, Strathcona County, and the county of Leduc, just to mention a few. And our goal at IPAC is to uh, bring together both new and experienced public servants, academics, and others in our region to promote public service innovation, foster collaboration, and recognize uh, excellence. And we do this through a variety of forums, including this Policy for Breakfast series. Uh, the support of uh, Myers Norris Penny and PwC Canada helps us provide the outstanding programs we offer uh, throughout the year, including events like uh, today's event. And the IPAC Edmonton Regional Group would like to uh, extend a sincere thanks to uh, our sponsors. So for more info on IPAC, how to join, and to learn about upcoming events, please visit the IPAC website at uh, ipac.ca slash Edmonton. And I'll put in a, a plug for our new public servants dinner on May 26th. Uh, if you haven't uh, signed up and registered, please uh, do so. So turning to this morning's event, we're very, very fortunate to welcome Dr. Roger Gibbons to speak with us about Looking West, which is the title of his new book, co-authored with uh, Lolene Birdall. Please note that Roger's presentation is being webcast live and will be archived on the IPAC Edmonton YouTube channel. This morning's Q&A period will not be recorded, however, so feel free to ask uh, Dr. Gibbons anything you, uh, you would uh, like. Dr. Gibbons is quite simply his generation's most prolific and well-respected scholars uh, on Western Canada. He is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the U of C, Senior Fellow and former President and CEO of the Canada West Foundation. Dr. Gibbons joined the Foundation in 1998 and under his leadership, it's been one of Canada's leading policy think tanks, providing a constructive voice for the West within uh, Canada. Dr. Gibbons conducts and interprets research regarding broad social and economic issues and is frequently asked to develop briefing documents for municipal, provincial, and federal governments. He's the author or co-author of 22 books and 140 articles and book chapters, mostly dealing with Western uh, Canadian issues and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and themes. Dr. Gibbons was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1998 and the Alberta Order of Excellence in 2013. In 2007, he was presented with the Lieutenant Governor's Award for Excellence in Public Administration by uh, IPAC. He received the Peter Lougheed Award for Public Policy Leadership in 2010. His topic is uh, timely. In Looking West, Dr. Gibbons and uh, Birdall explore the implications of Canada's westward demographic and economic shift, noting the many new opportunities and challenges that confront the region in the 21st century. In particular, I know we're all eager to hear his thoughts on the impact of the recent oil price crash, which took place just months after the uh, book was published. After generations of leaders promoting the notion that the West wants in, the question remains whether the region has found and will retain a more prominent place in the Canadian Federation. We can think of no one uh, better to answer these questions than uh, Dr. Gibbons. And even more timely, uh, the events of next week. I'm sure you'll have some questions for Dr. Gibbons on, uh, on those. So without further delay, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Roger Gibbons. Wow, 
I'll try and uh, stay away from the events of next week. Um, much as I can. I just note, however, that the the pollsters have really got themselves in a in a wonderful position, right? Looking at the poll this morning, if that's the way the election turns out, the pollsters say we got it right. If the election turns out entirely different, all they say is somewhere between midnight and three o'clock in the morning on you know Tuesday, people woke up and changed their minds, and it's not their fault, and, and they are always always accurate, even when they're wrong. It's a nice position to be in. So thanks for this opportunity. It's nice to be at the very heart of the uh, government of Alberta. I can feel the sort of the pulsing energy um, from, from the government. I want to uh, point out that my primary audience these days is my uh, three-year-old granddaughter. And uh, so if I suddenly yell out in the middle of the presentation, you know, don't jump, don't jump, or okay, but don't tell your parents. Uh, it's just force of habit. It's just things I go through. My co-author, uh, Lolene Berdahl, uh, regrets not being, being here. She's trying to protect her rapidly um, evaporating sabbatical and trying to lock herself down in, in Saskatoon, which sounds like a punishment more than anything else. But. So I'm on a much longer sabbatical. Uh, one that will end only by death, not by the start of the fall term. So I'm here and she's, uh, she's not. I'll focus my comments today on the, on the Looking West uh, book and little brochures on the, on the table. But I also want to talk a little bit about the uh, first book that I produced, which is Prairie Politics and, and Society. These two books uh, span 35 years, virtually my entire uh, academic and public policy uh, career. So they are the, the, the bookends of what I've tried to do, but they also illustrate, I think, the tremendous changes that have occurred in Western Canada over that 35-year period. They illustrate how much the region has changed, they also illustrate how much the technology of writing has changed, and I'll, I'll go into that uh, a little bit. And they also illustrate the, uh, the importance of timing for any publication. And I'll use both books to illustrate how the timing was awful, um, but that's, that's sort of the story of my life. So let me begin with the, with the book uh, Prairie Politics and Society. And the subtitle is a critical thing here, Regionalism in decline. So I washed up on the shores of Alberta in, in 1973. I came on the job market out of, out of California. Um, there were only three jobs available in Canada at that time in my field. One in Sackville, which seemed like an awfully long way away. One in Edmonton and one in Calgary. Uh, the Calgary and Edmonton jobs were pretty awful and the head of the Department of Political Science at, at uh, University of, Al of Alberta recommended that I take the Calgary position because it was a 10-month contract and the U of A contract was only eight months. And uh, so that's, that's what happened. To draw from a, a, a popular book at the time, I did feel very much like a stranger in a strange land. I come from, after four years of graduate school, uh, in California, very radical time in the U.S., arrived in Calgary, things were not as radical. I remember my first job interview in Calgary, we were sitting around uh, Professor Flanagan's house, you may have heard of Professor Flanagan. We sat around with a glass of wine and then the questioning began and the first question I, rec I received was, uh, Mr. Gibbons, would you agree that the civil rights movement in the United States is all part of a communist conspiracy orchestrated <laughs> out of Moscow. And I thought, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a long time. And even a 10-month contract is looking like it's going to be far, far too much. So I settled in in Calgary, and the book Prairie Politics and Society was my attempt to try to locate myself in this new part of the part of the world. I grown up in, in northern British Columbia, 
but the prairies were totally alien to me. I, it was just sort of this wasteland between between British Columbia and Toronto, and I knew there were people there, but you know, it was so, in a region I didn't know at all. And so I thought, well, the best way to come to grips with it is to write a book. And so I wrote a book trying to look at, at the evolution of prairie politics. This was my first real engagement with themes of Western alienation, which became so uh, important in my, my life. So you can look upon the book as the opening shot in the campaign of the West Wants In, uh, six years before Preston Manning and the Reform Party. At the time, Western Canada was a declining region in the, in the country. I think it's important to keep that in mind. From the end of the, end of the uh, Depression to 1971, the West share of the national population fell from about 31% to 26%. We were in, de we were in decline, and the new Canada was being defined outside the West. It was being defined in Montreal uh, and Toronto. The book then was built around a, a fairly simple convergence hypothesis, that the West was converging with, catching up, if you want, with the rest of Canada. And I argued, and just to quote a few lines from the, from the book, a new prairie society has emerged during the post-war period that more resembles the urban heartland of central Canada than it does its own rural agrarian past. I argue that Western Canada is becoming increasingly integrated into the national society and political behavior on the prairies is shedding its regional caste. The more populist and radical features that in the past set the prairies apart are in retreat. So this was six years before the creation of the Reform Party and, and all went hell in a handbasket. But I did argue that political integration tends to lag economic, social, and cultural integration. And I think that was part of the, part of the story. The book came out shortly after the 1980 election when the West was always shut out of the national government on the throes of the, of the, uh, or the start of the NEP. And I was able to write a, a, a two page sort of afterward explaining how I got it wrong, but regionalism was still in decline if you look at the economy, if you look at the society. Just to note the uh, changes in the writing technology. When I wrote this book in 1979, each chapter I hand wrote and mostly printed out, drove out to Cochrane, gave the manuscript to a typist, Cochrane, who typed it out for me at a dollar a page. I drove out to Cochrane, picked it up, drove it back, had one last look at it, corrected that, drove it back out to Cochrane. She retyped it, dollar a page, and then I mailed it off to Toronto where it was typeset. Could only afford two drafts, right? I would love to have written three or four drafts, but a dollar a page, I couldn't, I couldn't afford it. In fact, I'm astounded going back at the book how good the writing was, and also how by comparison, perhaps how bad my writing is getting now, even though I write in multiple, multiple drafts. The copy editing was done in Toronto, and there were some tensions between a Toronto-based copy editor and, and my own Western Canadian um, background. And during this period, I developed a real Western Canadian chip on my shoulder that came from the, the Canada Council. 73, I landed at the University of Calgary, spend the summer writing my thesis, the fall comes, and I think, thank God, I'm just gonna concentrate on, on teaching. It's gonna be fun, I'm gonna catch up, new, new child, uh, this, will be, this will be fun. Down the hall comes our new research grants officer in the department, Tom Flanagan, who says, you have to apply for a grant. So I don't wanna apply for a grant, I wanna put my feet up. He said, you have to apply for a grant. So I applied for a grant looking at the attitudinal nature of Canadian nationalism. What are the sort of, um, how do attitudes towards Quebec, attitudes towards the United States, attitudes towards the West, how do they get woven into some 
sort of uh, reasonable uh, portrait. Send the application off to the county council, which would now be Shirk, was rejected with a very nice letter saying, we really like your project, but you can't study Canadian nationalism in Calgary. So <laughs> if you, I swear, if you want to do this study, in Hamilton or London, Ontario, we will fund it. But we can't fund the story of Say uh, Canadian nationalism in Calgary. I was young enough and angry enough, I guess, that I, I sent a letter off saying, you've got to be crazy. And uh, to their credit, they said, I guess we are crazy. They did fund it, and it produced hard data on Western alienation, just as Western alienation came into vogue. So I hit the, uh, hit the wave. But it always stuck, st stuck with me, the assumption that Canadian nationalism was somehow outside the region, that the West was not part of that body of nationalist thought. And what I've tried to argue, I guess, ever since, is that in many ways, the West has shaped and will continue to shape the dimensions of Canadian nationalism. Well, let me shift to the, to the, second, the second book, The Looking West, Regional Transformation in the Future of Canada. This uh, shifts from the three prairie provinces to the four Western Canadian provinces. BC is brought in in full, in full uh, form. And I'll note here that for much of my career in looking at Western Canadian politics, BC was very much of, a, of an outlier. Although it was the largest province, or became the largest province during that time, it, it punched below its weight all the time. It had a series of, of premiers who could best be described as erratic. Um, uh, BC politics were sort of, sort of weird. Um, BC was just sort of out there. And Alberta was a province that was able to speak for the West. And Premier Lahey did this all the time. He would talk about the West when he was actually talking about Alberta. But it worked because no one cared about BC. Saskatchewan and Manitoba were basket cases. And so Alberta was really, was, was the West. No longer the case, right? We have a far more balanced region, both politically and economically. The book reflects the fact, I think it's an indisputable fact, that the country and the world have tipped west in response to the very dramatic economic change in the Asian, in the Asian countries. We are now um, a Western country, a Western, uh, Western region, I suppose. Think of the uh, odd illustration of this, National Hockey League. When I was growing up, you could cheer for Toronto or Montreal. That was it. Now, four of the seven NHL teams, Canadian NHL teams, are in Western Canada. Three and a half, I guess, would be <laughs> take Edmonton into, into, into account. And that's, a fair, that's a fairly significant shift in the, nature, in the nature of the country. So in the book, we identify a number of changes that have... I think are not only changes but trends going ahead. So what do we what do we find? The population shift into Western Canada continues. It's not a stampede. It's not a flood, but it's this sort of steady drip, drip, drip of people coming into into the West. For most of the last thirty to thirty five years, it's been about twenty five thousand people a year net have come into Western Canada from other parts of the other parts of the country. Immigration is now back as a major force in Western Canada. For a while, at the end of the Second World War, no one in the right mind would immigrate from anywhere to Western Canada, right? This, this was a, sort of an awful place to be. Who would want to, to immigrate and be a farmer in Saskatchewan? You'd have to be mentally disturbed to be able to do that. So, but now, immigration is once more a major contributor uh, to the Western Canadian population. The economy has been going our way. Alberta is emerging as somewhat of an exception in, the, in this case. Asian trade 
tends to originate in Western Canada. Asian investment tends to find its uh, natural environment in Western, sorry, in Western Canada. Politically, the West is gaining in seats. It's gaining in, in political political power in all sorts of ways. And so, the book tries to point out this fundamental demographic, economic change that has been occurring that has put Western Canada at the center of things. In a book published a couple of years ago by Daryl Bricker and, and John Ibbotson, they say the West will increasingly become the center of Canada. That's a fairly bold statement, and I think they've caught the essence of, what, of the transforma transformation that's taking place. We argue, Lolina well, and I, that the new Canada is unfolding in the West and that the future prosperity of Canada will be determined in the West. This goes back to my earlier rant about nationalism. You can't understand the nature of the country without coming to grips with Western Canada in a way that you could back in 1970 or 1980. West didn't matter, now it does. It is interesting to note how fundamentally our political discourse has changed. Most of my academic life was built around the, the national question, that is reaching an accommodation between English and French Canada. That, that's sort of off the, off the table now. You couldn't get three people out to a bar giving, offering three free drinks in Vancouver to talk about national unity issues. Quebec is, is out there somewhere, I guess, but it's, it's a different environment now. The discussion is about global positioning, and that discussion is being led in Western Canada. So we argue that for better or for worse, the major challenges that Canada will face in the years ahead tend to apply with greatest force to the Western Canada, to, to the West. They manifest themselves more in Western Canada than they do elsewhere. Asian trade and Asian investment, huge issues to come to grips with. Aboriginal people, Aboriginal aspirations. Aboriginal Canada is largely a Western Canadian uh, reality, not a Canadian reality. Immigration and multiculturalism, again, very much Western Canadian issues. Urban renewal, the major cities, the major urban developments are tending to take place in the West where the cities are relatively new and urban growth is, is highest. Labor shortages are gonna manifest themselves across Canada, but particularly in the West. And put Alberta aside here for just a, just a second. And the issue of the, of, the, um, of the day for Canada, I think, is how do we transition from a resource-based economy to a different kind of economic space in the global economy. How do we manage that transition? And that's going to play out more so in Western Canada than anywhere else. We are the test case, if you want. And if we get this right in the West, we'll get it right for Canada. And if we get it wrong in the West, we'll get it wrong in Canada. So the West is so important to argue, because of this constellation of challenges that happen to, to be so important, so central to this region of the, of the country. And that leads us then to make the argument that we've moved from uh, an argument about convergence, we talked about in the, in the Prairie Politics book, to leadership. That it's not a matter of catching up it's not a matter of convergence. It's now a matter of Western Canadian leadership. The change has come from the West wants in to the West defining Canada's position in the new global economy. And I say it's not because we're particularly insightful, that we're particularly brilliant. It's just that these challenges are coming home to roost here more dramatically than they will elsewhere. So as I say, the national question today is not the place of Quebec and Canada. 
It's really the place of Canada within the global economy. And that's what we're looking at. So the West is no longer sort of a problem to be solved. It's an opportunity to be seized. So let me, let me conclude with some comments about writing in 2014 as opposed to 1979. First of all, I'll note the timing issue. You know, we wrote, published, I published uh, uh, Prairie Politics and Society just as everything went to hell in a handbasket and my, my regionalism and decline thesis looked a little bit suspect. I survived. So our new book, uh, Lolina and I, our, our book, came out, of course, just before uh, the Alberta economy uh, hit, the, hit the skids. And uh, our prognosis, if you want, about a dynamic, ever-expanding Western Canadian economy has taken a bit, of a, a bit of a hit. But I think the underlying demographic and economic changes that we identify are going to, are going to play out. 1979, I wrote about the Prairie West because I was trying to understand the Prairie West. Now you can't write about Western Canada without bringing BC into play. And BC's political leadership is much more national now than it used to be in the past. Since Gordon Campbell's time, BC premiers have been national players in a way that was not the, not the case. It's very different writing a co-authored book than writing a single authored book. Uh, Lolina and I have now written five books together, so we, we work very smoothly, and we never met to talk about uh, the, the uh, book Looking West. All email correspondence, all moving chapter drafts back and forth. No longer did I have to drive out to Cochrane uh, to deliver my, uh, my manuscript. And so the stuff that I write now probably goes through 25, 40 drafts at the front end of what I'm writing. The back end, the concluding paragraph gets one, one cut, but the front end is really polished, really polished, and is probably no better uh, than the stuff I drove out to, drove out to Cochrane. Lolene and I had an interesting tension in writing the book. Uh, she was coming up for promotion to full professor at the University of Saskatchewan. And so I was very, very concerned about um, publishing norms and, and, and the academic requirements. So her draft chapter would have 250, 300 footnotes. My draft chapter would have one. Because <laughs> I was sort of sitting back in my chair and thinking, well, if I think this is true, then <laughs> must, must be true, right? <laughs> No need for documentation. And, and in fact, I found myself, I found I was plagiarizing myself because I, <laughs> I'd written about the same things for so long that I was conjuring up things that I've written in the past that were actually plagiarizing myself. So there's a little thing at the front of the book saying, you know, don't worry about plagiarism. It's just, just happens. <laughs> anyway, Lolene say, well, I'm going to be very, very sure that, uh, Everything was perfectly correct. So, for example, the Queen came to Canada in, in April 17th, uh, 1982, to sign the Constitution Act. It was a cold, wet, nasty day. So, you know, her first draft would say it was a cold, and then there'd be a footnote, uh, you know, going to <laughs> Environment Canada says that on that day it was, you know, and a rainy, and then there'd be another footnote saying, yes, it didn't need rain. And, and so we had to moderate this and move her back from, from um, 250 footnotes and, and bolster my uh, footnoting up. And she would say, look, you can't just say you believe this is the case. You've got to bring other people into play. Anyway, it was fun. Uh, uh, very light copy editing this time around. Almost, almost none. That seems to be declining as a feature of academic publishing. And the big challenge we faced was an odd one, and that was coming up with a cover photograph. They're talking about Western Canada. Western Canada has all kinds of iconic imagery that can be used. Alberta is a great example. Of, you know, there are photographs of Alberta, the foothills of the Rockies that are so, are so compelling. Photographs of Saskatchewan, again, 
it's easy to capture the essence of the, of the problems. Manitoba is a little bit more difficult, but imagine sort of a giant mosquito in snowshoes. That would be <laughs> sort of, you know, everyone would say, yeah, that's, that's Manitoba. BC, very different. So we couldn't find a photograph that was regional. We could only find photographs that were provincial. And we ended up then with um, the cover picture you have, which is looking out on English Bay in Vancouver. It captures the notion of looking west. It captures the notion that the future is out there uh, towards Asia. And if you look really carefully, carefully you can even see my condo uh, <laughs> in, the, in, in the picture. But we tried to find a picture that would capture the theme of the book, the essence of the book. That's what we came up with. We also needed a, a cover, of course, that, that captured the largest market in Western Canada, which is British Columbia with 45% of the regional population. So that's why we couldn't have Saskatchewan, couldn't have Manitoba, might have had Alberta, but we didn't. So let me wrap up. Um, if looking west is my uh, swan song, I think I'll go to a very optimistic swan. I'm very optimistic in terms of the place of the West in Canada, the contribution of the West in Canada. Uh, I'm much less optimistic about the rest of the world, but in terms of what has happened to this region of the country since I arrived in 1973, I'm very upbeat about the changes that have occurred in Western Canada. And I'm, I think I will remain optimistic even as Alberta struggles at the present time with its own, with its own economy. So let me stop there and I'd be happy to take any questions or or any comments you might you might have. I think we've got 20